Okay then, uh, so we'll make a start. We're here back for Communist Radio. We are back. We are back, and it is the morning on which, literally actually just a couple of minutes before we start recording this, the election in the US has now been called for Donald Trump. Yep. Major, uh, major events. Yes. And... I mean, everyone's talking about it in the office at the moment. There's lots of conversations going on all around us. We thought we would just get in front of the microphones and give our initial thoughts. What is your initial thought? This election, all I can think is what a, what a damning indictment on the Democrats. And I think people, I said that last night I was at the US Embassy to protest. I should clarify. Um, there's an encampment outside. There's an encampment outside it. And we had a protest outside. And yeah, this is what I was talking about. I said this in a speech. You know, the whole world is looking at America thinking, what on earth is happening there? Trump is this insane man. And yet the Democrats are totally incapable of defeating him. The entire US establishment is completely incapable. The entire US. Yeah, that's that's it. And what a damning indictment. And And I think that... It just speaks to the like rottenness, really, of the American establishment right now and its complete inability to understand what is happening. The reason the Democrats, and Kamala Harris in particular, have lost is because they do not understand why people support Trump. And so they ran a similar election campaign. They basically just tried to do what Hillary Clinton did in 2016. And even though it didn't work then, shockingly, it hasn't worked again. So why do people support Trump? People support Trump because in a tragic way, he comes across as the anti-establishment candidate. This is, this is what the Democrats don't understand. Whilst Trump was there in a distorted demagogic manner, speaking actually to the working class in America, what was Kamala Harris doing? Yeah. She was hanging out with Beyonce. She was getting billionaire endorsement endorsements. I saw that a strategist for the Democratic Party was quoted as saying in the aftermath of this defeat, we need to stop being the party of Hollywood yeah. and we need to talk to ordinary people. Yeah. And that is the point. Trump has spoken to the working class. He yeah. speaks to the working class. Yeah. He speaks on reactionary issues, Absolutely. but he speaks to the working class. Yeah. And he, he does he talks about the economy. He talks about the things that actually matter to them. Yeah. And I think that is why he's won. And as you say, he does it in a reactionary manner. He blames immigrants for the cost of living crisis. But he's saying, I know your life is getting harder. Meanwhile, Beyonce's got, getting Taylor Swift and Leonardo DiCaprio. And as you say, Hollywood, billionaires literally, to come out and say, oh, you've got to support Kamala Harris because isn't it time that we had a woman in charge? And it totally, it totally misunderstands, misreads, and doesn't answer fundamentally the problems in people's lives. Um, we have to explain that Trump's answer is a total lie as well. He isn't actually an anti-establishment candidate. Is you know he's got Elon Musk on his side, and he's got plenty of billionaires actually on his side as well. But this this election result is it is just a damning indictment on 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 yeah the democrats but also just the whole of the american establishment they have created trump and trumpism over years and years and years of 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 actually attacking the working class yeah that's it and and the point is that now this opens up a really unstable situation within the united states because there's this big anti-establishment movement that has been generated and it's feeling very emboldened now, but also on a world scale, because the US is the most powerful imperialist nation and its actions, what goes on inside the US is obviously going to have an impact. Now that there's a lot more that could be said, I think, about the United States, what's yes. going on there, the election, everything else. I, I, I'm pretty certain that our international comrades, that our US comrades will be putting all kinds of stuff out about that. Yeah. We'll leave that to them. Yeah. Because this has literally just happened anyway. There's a limited yes. amount we can go into all of the analysis. But what we can say something about, and what we can have a bit of a think about now, is what is the impact of a second Trump presidency on the UK? Yeah. And, I mean, for, I think the first thing is that this is going to be a bit difficult for <laughs> Starmer 
to say the least. To say the least. I mean, Starmer, um, we were talking earlier about polls in Britain um, that in terms of like who people support in America. And did you say 18%? 18, that's the number that I saw, 18%. Only 18% of people in Britain wanted to like support Trump, basically, or would have, you know, preferred a Trump victory. And so now Starm has already congratulated him and will presumably, you know, have to fly over soon and have a meeting or whatever it is. And this is going to enrage people. Yeah. Do you remember Do you remember how enraged people were when Theresa May went over to the White House and was photographed holding Donald Trump's yeah. hand yeah. as they walked out for a press conference? Yeah, that's so funny. That'll be the same thing when Star was over there holding, holding his, hand. his hand. Yeah, exactly. And David Lammy, who's already given his congratulations. Oh, David Lammy, what is there to say? I mean, he's a joke of a man. He's a he is a he's a disgrace. David Lammy in 2016, I think it was 2016, said that Trump was a neo-Nazi KKK sympathizer, yes, a sociopath. A sociopath. And today he said, "Congratulations, Donald Trump." And looking I'm looking forward. forward. To I'm looking forward to work. And like. It's it's bonkers and it's bizarre, but as you say, all this is going to do is make people even angrier at Starmer and at Lammy and really further entrench this idea that there's no... Di- you're all the same. You're all the same. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's won. Um, and, and, it, and it also is going to complicate things from them, not just in terms of their own polls and popularity, but in terms of their interests abroad. I mean, we, should, we can talk about Britain, um, but also what British imperialism has been trying to maintain in the world. Um, I mean, one of the first things that I thought about when, you know, we, we saw the announcement about Trump was Ukraine yeah, um, and, and Zelensky. Uh, Zelensky, who's also offered his congratulations to Trump very quickly. He's yeah. obviously quite worried about what's going to happen now to the Ukrainian war effort against Russia. Well, exactly. I mean, Trump has made it you know, quite clear throughout his election campaign that he wants to see a quick end to the war in Ukraine. And that goes against what Starmer and Lamy have been pushing for. I mean, it was only a month or so ago, right, that Starmer and Lamy flew to Washington to ask Biden for approval for missiles to be launched into Russia. They basically went there saying we should escalate this conflict. And even at that time, Biden said, no, you guys need to hold back. Um, and so Trump is going to be even further removed from, from that sort of idea. And that's going to be very difficult for them to manage because they've invested a lot in trying to whip up propaganda for further supporting the war in Ukraine. Yeah, and extending it. I mean, they are going to be let... Trump has, has promised that he's going to bring that war to an end. Yeah. He's probably going to do that with what will basically be quite a bad deal for Ukraine. Yeah. Probably there will be costs involved, maintaining the peace, maybe a, some kind of neutral zone in between the two countries. Who knows? But the costs involved are going to be borne by the Europeans. Mm. Well, we were talking just before we started recording, and you were pointing out that Britain has guaranteed a number of loans to Ukraine. It's underwritten a load of its debt, basically. Yeah, yeah. That debt's not getting paid back, no way. Yeah. And Britain is also going to then have to pay some of the costs of maintaining security in the region, as will the other European nations. They're going to have to sell this incredibly expensive and incredibly bad peace deal Mm -hmm. after years of whipping up war. Yeah. From Boris Johnson to Rishi Sunak to Stam. And and yeah, as you say, and that kind of quick switch up is is going to provoke something. Of course. It's going to provoke... And anger because you, you, people are just being like, you know, bandied about, I don't know if that's the right word, um, from all these massive events taking place. And, 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 and the Labour government and Starmer, they, they really presented themselves as the sensible ones, right? That was a big thing. The Tories, they've gone mad, they're a bit insane, whatever. We're going to refix the foundations of our economy. Oh, sorry, Trump's now just won. And now it's going to rip everything up that they've been working towards. Yeah, I think that's it. It's going to provoke a lot of anger against the government that people are going to feel lied to. There's going to be even less trust in, in all of the government institutions, uh, in like the diplomatic staff, for example, in the military. All of this is going to be undermined by this whole situation. Yeah. So that's another, another major headache for Starmer, for the UK establishment. Yeah. 
I mean, the question of, of, of Palestine, of the Middle East, that's a little bit harder to work out what's going to happen because on the one hand, Trump is a big Netanyahu fan. Yeah. That's been for a long time. Yeah. On the other hand, he has spoken about bringing some kind of deal to that region. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, an, another aspect, I think, of support that Trump had was he was and is kind of seen almost as an anti-war, as an anti-war candidate in comparison to Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, under whom, you know, America's involvement in foreign wars and so on and so on, like, seemed to increase so much. And I remember in the you know, last couple of weeks before the election, he was calling them warmongers, yeah, that's right. in fact. But anyway, I mean... But I mean, on that, look, I think we're about to... To the extent that that actually does happen in the Middle East, some kind of peace deal, we're about to get a lesson in an imperialist peace being just as bad as an imperialist war. Exactly. Nothing that Trump does. Trump is not a friend of the Palestinians. He's not a friend of Lebanon. No. He is very militantly opposed to Iran and very closely allied with Netanyahu. And we saw that in his previous administration. That's what, exactly. So nothing good will come for the oppressed people in that region from a Trump presidency, peace or war. I think what we're going to see is, is Biden-backed war as a way of achieving strategic aims of US imperialism and, and siding with Israel and so on. Trump might push for peace, but it will be to achieve the exact same, day, same aims, which are those of US imperialism. And the situation in Gaza, in Lebanon, and everywhere else is going to get increasingly worse. The point is, whatever Starmer does, or rather, whatever Trump does, Starmer will just follow like a little lapdog. Exactly. And he will bear responsibility also for this, whatever deal or no deal or continuation of the war, whatever happens there, Starmer is going to bear responsibility for Trump's decisions, which you can bet will not be in the interests of. Uh, of the oppressed people of that region. Yeah, he cannot distance himself from any of this. I mean, this is a big thing. They always talk about the US-UK special relationship and Lamy will be keen. I mean, he already was, I think, a couple of months ago. I mean, well, Starmer did meet Trump, actually. Yeah, yeah, a couple yeah. of months ago, they had a dinner, a two-hour dinner. Um said it was good. <laughs> good. Lamy, I think, was also courting some Republicans here and there. I mean, all of it just, they're, it's like a center, America is a center of gravity for Western imperialism and Britain is just running after them. And it means whatever hope they had in trying to water down anger in this country over what's happening in Gaza is, is going to be shattered. Um, and not just Gaza, across the whole of the Middle East, as you say. Because one, politically what's happening will enrage people. But also all of this has an impact on the world economy as well, which is going to impact what the Labour government is doing um, yes. and who who has to pay for these these problems and these crises. Yeah. And, look, and on that question of, of who pays economic questions, this is also going to be a bit of a problem for the UK government because Britain has £180 billion pounds worth of exports to the US every year. I'm pretty sure that's the figure. It's certainly around, somewhere around there, £180 billion of exports. And Trump has promised to put a 10 to 20% tariff on every single import into the US. Yeah. And that's going to include stuff coming from Britain. Not only that, Trump has said he's going to put very heavy tariffs on stuff coming from China to the US. 60%, yeah. up to 100% on some things. That is going to push prices up. And the US economy is, is, by most measures, the largest economy in the world. And so that is going to have an impact across the entire world. There's going to be a domino effect. Prices are going to get pushed up. Yeah. There's going to be more economic instability. And so pricing get pushed up in this country. So all, these, all this stuff that we heard last week, or whenever it was, when the budget came out, about, well, things are settling down, but we've got these big black holes. So we've got to do big things now, but... From, from here on out, it's all going to be plain sailing. That's rubbish. Yeah. This Trump presidency is going to upset the economic situation even more, I would, yes. I would say. And that is going to reflect very badly. It's going to reflect on the economic policies of the UK government, of the Labour government. Yeah, we, we discussed the budget last week. And one of the things we were saying is a big part of the rhetoric, the pomp, p p pomperiety, what am I trying to say? <laughs> the pompous something oh, okay whatever um, a different one. okay <laughs> a big part of the 
the vibes around the budget was um was what Britain's back right Britain's back and you should invest in Britain and Rachel Reeves is kind of on this thing like you know we can all invest in Britain and, and so on and so forth as though they're going to kind of rechart Britain's role on the world stage and in the world economy and we spoke about how that was kind of unlikely to happen but also with Trump it's even harder because the reason I'm mentioning this is you know even though it wasn't like the this current Labour government that led the Brexit campaign but a big part of the Brexit messaging was after this we'll create our own relate trade relationships yeah. and we'll create a special relationship with America and that's going to set everything up and Trump's not interested in that. Look, Biden wasn't interested in that Trump yeah. is going to be even less interested in that yeah it is it's quite pathetic because that's the other thing, Rachel Reeves has said that even if Trump imposed tar- imposes tariffs on British exports to the United States, Britain won't retaliate. It won't impose. Yeah, she did say that. Um, yeah, impose any tariffs on stuff coming from the US to Britain. Yes. So it's, it's this desperate. Uh, it is quite pathetic, but that is a reflection of the weakness <laughs> of British imperialism, of the British economy on the global stage these yeah. days. And it's true that like they have been they've been desperately going after a free trade deal with the US. That's not going to happen. No. Brexit has thrown up a load of barriers between the UK and the EU economies. So now you've got you've got the UK economy in this limbo, in this, yeah. in this really terrible situation. The only way, the only way that a free trade deal might be done between the UK and the US would be if the UK opened up things like healthcare mm. to private US companies. Yes. In other words, broke apart the NHS and sold it off to American multinationals. Yeah. And if they did that, you can imagine the, the political or the social reaction that there would be to that. Absolutely. So they're, they're stuck between two impossible decisions. Either the British economy is isolated and weak and getting weaker, or they basically just allow US multinationals to come in and take everything over and privatise everything. Either way, there's going to be a massive... Re- people's lives are going to get worse, people's wallets are going to shrink, and there's going to be a reaction to it. Exactly. And what is the alternative? Who is saying anything about any of this, right? There's nothing from the left. There's no, like, yeah, there's nothing from the left. In fact, the only person posing themselves as a sort of alternative to the problems in Britain right now, in a radical way, is actually Nigel Farage. Well, that's right. And, and this is it, because he's in, he's in America now. He's loving it. He's having a great time. This is his, uh, this is his fantasy. <laughs> I saw him at a Trump rally. I think it was on like the night, the day before the election. I saw him. Trump was calling him out, saying, "Oh, this guy Nigel's here from the UK. This is yeah. fantastic." Yeah. So yeah, he's over there. He's having a good time. But but that, that the point is that he and people like him are going to be massively emboldened by this Trump victory. Yes. That's the other big impact on British politics it's going to have. Yes, we've already seen those far right riots. Yeah, we saw reform doing well at relatively at the election. And yeah, when the budget happened, Farage was the only one basically saying people people are getting poorer. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously he blames immigration. Yeah. Just like Trump has said and spoken to working class people and said, You're you're worse off and the reason is immigration. But he's at least he's acknowledging that people are worse off. Who is acknowledging that here in Britain? No yeah. one. So yeah, but the right is going to be massively emboldened and they are going to try and copy Trump. They're going to use 100%. his talking points. And also his style and, and, and the way in which he conducts himself in his politics. Yeah. It's going to be massively involved, I think. Yeah, it, this will have a very dangerous knock-on effect across across Europe for um, right-wing parties and the far right. Um, as you say, we've already seen the far right um, riots over the summer before a Trump victory. And that's what we said, I remember, in, even in 2016 when Trump first won, is it did embolden and it allowed people to feel more comfortable, the most rotten layers in society, to freely express their ideas and organise in a way they haven't done before. And ramp up the culture wars. And ramp up the culture war. And so, yeah, Reform, Nigel have watched that very closely and they're going to bring a lot of that back. Um, which again poses this question of, of what is the alternative? How do we cut through all of this? Because it is very important, this huge vacuum that exists and this anger. Um, you, you've got to say, yeah, in terms of vacuum, the, like the left, the kind of official left, to the extent that such a thing exists anymore, post-Corbyn movement, is 
woeful. I mean, it basically doesn't exist. There is absolutely nothing being put forward or organized or anything, nothing that is credible in any way that offers some kind of radical left alternative. It is a, a really shocking picture, I would say. Yeah. And yet it creates a massive vacuum and a lot of frustration. A lot of frustration. Um, but I think that's why we have experienced, because th- th- this is the also kind of tragic and strange contradiction of the times we live in. There is um, this you know, horrific rise of the people, people like Nigel Farage's huge vacuum. And yet young people and students are really looking towards radical left-wing ideas. I think there will be a lot of pessimism, um, a lot of sadness and anger today, you know, looking at the Trump victory, which is completely understandable, um, the fears and so on and so forth that people might have. But we would say, we would try and remind people that society is polarizing, it's convulsing, it's not a static picture where one right-wing demagogue in the form of Trump or whoever it is, will dominate the here on ever. But actually there's so much happening underneath the surface. And what we've experienced in our autumn offensive um, over the last six to eight weeks is an absolute, you know, yearning for radical left-wing, revolutionary, even communist ideas. Um, I know our American comrades have experienced that as well, not just recently, but over the last year or so. But we are experiencing that here in Britain. Yeah, I think it's because we are able to connect with that mood that is under the surface. Just because there isn't a clear expression of it on the surface doesn't mean that it's not there and developing. Yeah. There's a, there, is, there is a lot of... Dis- I mean, what about this? You were telling me about this text that you got from your... Oh my gosh, yeah. My sister texted this morning in our family group chat to say... Um, I don't think I've ever been happy with the outcome of an election in my whole adult life. And, and she's a bit older than me. Um, And that I think is, yeah, a shared feeling because what does that, what is that going to make people think? We've already kind of identified this, that for a whole layer of young people, they don't have many illusions in reformism or the idea that you can change things within the system or anything like this, because every couple of years, an election comes about and what changes things are getting worse even when they're sometimes voting for the so-called lesser evil candidate which they did when they elected joe biden which will happen and is happening with starmer um this is this is what we should focus on yeah is and that i think that is that is what the 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 comrades are focusing on mainly in the branches on the campuses Everything that we're doing is trying to connect with that mood and it is yielding results because I think that mood is quite prominent. That idea that that every they're all the same, that elections, the whole lot, the whole regime is completely useless. Yeah. It's pointless, it's rotten, however you want to put it. But we are connecting with that, I think. And I mean you're seeing it, all the reports that I'm reading coming in from the branches are extremely positive, the comrades are are finding people who are quite radicalised and angry. But just this morning, for example, I heard a report, I think it's York, I think already someone has got in touch and said, look, I have, I've been following the RCP, but now I would like to join because of this election result in the US, because I can see that something more radical needs to be done. Yeah, we're going to get a lot more of that. Mm-hmm. And it's especially young people, and that's why it's especially significant that a lot of our autumn offensive has been at universities, it's been on campuses, because that's where there's a large concentration of young people. Yeah in most towns and cities around the country. So I think it's, I think the number is something like 63 places. We have 63 universities across the country. We've had a big presence over the last couple of months. And 90% of our new recruits in the last two months have been students. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, welcome to all of them. Hopefully they're listening. This <laughs> is this is really important. Mm. And, and, it's, and, and, the res- and the party is growing as a result. The last membership number I was given was 1,200 members. So we're growing. We're especially growing amongst that younger layer. And I think it's because we're tapping into this, this anger that exists beneath the surface, the idea that the whole system is wrong. Yeah. People want to do something. They yeah. want to do something. When election results like this come out and 
people feel threatened or whatever it is, they they will look around and, and it's important for us. And that's why we've made such a big effort, as you say, to be on the campuses, to be present, to be bold and say, this is the alternative that you're looking for. Not everyone will have it in their minds like, yes, revolutionary communist party. Although we surprisingly meet a lot of people who have heard about us and, and know about us. Um, but I think that's what people are, are most interested in is like I need to do something about this now. I need to join a party. Um, yeah, that's it. Work. And and what we need to do, I think, what our comrades, what members of the RCP need to do now, in the wake of this US election, is is to try and explain what is going on to people because it is as you said. There might be there'll be some layers who are a bit pessimistic. Some people are a bit pessimistic, a bit downbeat. Uh, others who maybe can see a bit of the significance of it, can see it's an anti-establishment thing, but they, there's this contradiction because although Trump is, has, has energized this anti-establishment movement, he is obviously clearly reactionary himself and very much of the establishment, a billionaire, a bourgeois, a capitalist and so on. Yeah. How, do, how do we explain all of this and in particular the, the perspectives? We've just tried to go over a little bit of the perspectives for Britain that's going to create a lot of anger against the against the UK government, against the Labour government. It's going to open up, therefore, a lot of instability for that government. This is the perspective that we have here. What does it mean for the world? There's a lot that needs explaining. And I think that is the main job of RCP members now, is to kind of patiently explain the situation to people. Uh, and that, hopefully, is what... I mean, we've got a new paper that is going to press today. That's going to go. That's going to have lots of stuff on the US. That would be quite useful for the comrades. Um, but we've also got the Revolution Festival in... Yeah just over a week now, a week and a half, something like that. Mm -hmm. And that, 30 whatever sessions on different aspects of Marxist theory, that is a, you want an explanation of everything that's going on in the world at the moment? Yeah. That is definitely gonna be it, including on the US, US. specifically. Yeah. yeah, we have Antonio B Balmer. 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 Okay. I'm sorry, Antonio. You can apologize when he gets here. I can apologize when he gets here because he is coming um, to the Revolution Festival which is really amazing. So Antonio is a leading comrade of the Revolutionary Communists of America, and he's gonna come over to explain the, the crisis in the US basically, and probably paint out the map. That's the wrong phrase. <laughs> probably. <laughs> and he is going to set out the processes that have taken place over the last couple of years and probably even going a bit further back um that has produced trump and trumpism and explain in more detail why why the democrats have been unable to beat him and also perhaps more importantly the perspectives going forward the perspectives for class struggle because there is you know still this huge anger and okay trump can present himself as the alternative he won't actually be able to fix things so where is that anger going to go next yeah. um and and i'm really really looking forward to hearing what he has to say about that in his session and he's also going to speak at the rally our our with, you. with me the books not bombs rally, and Antonio rally on saturday night that's it so yeah we're really lucky um to be having that that perspective yeah i mean he'll also as well as explaining what is quite a complicated and I suppose nuanced situation in the US to understand all the different currents as well as all of that you will we'll also be able to chat to them a bit about what our American comrades are doing and how yes. they're dealing in this whole situation and what the mood is like and what yeah the mood on the ground there's only so much you can get out of the reports of the bourgeois press but yeah. what is that what is it like what are people talking about in the in the bars and on yes. the streets and stuff well exactly because according to the bourgeois media Kamala was going to win yeah yeah <laughs> so that would be <laughs> quite interesting said. to hear from him for that uh, but that's so that's the Revolution Festival. That's a week and a half. We've got a very good, we're expecting a very good turnout for that. Yeah. Uh, now the ticket sales are, as they always do, closer to the event, really ramping up. So I'm looking forward to that. And hopefully everybody listening to this will also be coming. <laughs> I should expect so. Okay, good stuff. Well, uh, I think that's probably as much as we can cover now. Yeah. Um, there'll be loads more stuff coming out. There'll be more podcasts. There'll be articles. There's the paper. Yeah. So take yeah, it all in. we've got, yeah, everybody's got to take all of that in, digest it. And then we, we go to the people looking towards us, looking towards the party, looking for an explanation, a communist, revolutionary, left-wing explanation for the situation. We explain the situation to them and, and why they've got to get involved with the RCP. That's, that's the task. That's the job. Thank you, Ben. All right, good stuff. Cheers, Fiona.